Uh, yes, ma'am. We are live now. Please start. Uh, ma'am, please unmute. Is the screen uh, visible clearly? And uh, ah, yes, ma'am. Screen and audio is fine, ma'am. Please. Start. Okay. Thank you. So, um, shall I start the talk? Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. I am uh, Manjiri Jain from Isar Mohadi. Um, I'm an associate professor uh, in biology, uh, and I study uh, acoustic communication in animals. Uh, both insects and birds and uh, specifically I am interested in how animals uh, uh, encode information in their signals and how do they perceive those signals and extract that information from these acoustic signals. Um, but I'm broadly interested in uh, uh, animal behavior and ecology and uh, my uh, thesis work, PhD thesis work was on nocturnal insects and uh, ever since I have been very interested in the nocturnal landscape and animals that occupy this uh, uh, amazing and not so uh, explored niche. Um, so today, uh, in today's talk, I would like to talk about uh, nocturnal insects, uh, some nocturnal insects, there are several, and uh, I would like to give you a flavor of uh, the kinds of interesting aspects of their bio biology that there is. And I hope that it will excite uh, you, whether you are interested in biology or in engineering, or uh, uh, you are here just uh, to, uh, uh, because you're interested in nature. So I hope there'll be a little bit of something for everyone here in this talk. So if, uh, let me first start with uh, asking each one of you to think about uh, when we talk about biodiversity, um, what comes to our mind first when we talk about Earth's biodiversity. And I was just, uh, for this talk, I was just going through various images and cartoons and posters so to understand the perception of common perception of biodiversity. And these are two uh, images which I got. And as you can see, there are a lot of mammals here and there are several birds here. I do see uh, several fishes, some reptiles. Uh, with these plants here again, there are some insects here again, a lot of uh, mammals, but yeah, mostly uh, large vertebrates. So somehow our notion or the common perception of biodiversity is uh, formed uh, by uh, large uh, vertebrates. Okay. And we really think that uh, probably uh, they form the largest chunk of uh, the biodiversity that we see around us. But that is not correct, simply because uh, uh, we know that over a little over 50% of the Earth's biodiversity comes from insects alone. And if we uh, combine other invertebrates, okay, so it will be close to uh, a little over 70% will be coming from uh, invertebrates, okay, as opposed to um, chordates where vertebrates will be here. And you see they are just 3% of the diversity of described species. Of course, there's a projected or estimated number of species uh, in which uh, the vertebrates are likely to have an even smaller fraction, okay? So the large chunk of our diversity comes from insects. And uh, despite their abundance, despite their diversity, uh, we do not know enough about them. And this in this slide, I have, I'm showing you a picture of uh, uh, celebrated um, entomologist and who we say the father of sociobiology, uh, Professor E.O. Uh, Wilson. Um, he has worked extensively on social insects. And I am just uh, showing you an, uh, a small um, uh, excerpt of what he wrote about insects. So the phrase that he uses uh, for invertebrates is uh, little things that run the world. And um, uh, he says, and I quote, that the truth is that we need invertebrates, but they do not need us. So when I'm talking about insects, insects are included. 
under invertebrates okay so we now need to think of rethink biodiversity and our earth uh, the organisms that surround us uh, with a new uh, perspective and a light and uh, what wilson says is if human beings were to disappear uh, there is very little that is going to change for earth so things are still going to be the same if anything the earth is likely to heal over time but if invertebrates were to disappear and which again like i said a large fraction comes from insects then the earth would practically start rotting you know one after the other uh, various groups of species are going to disappear the fishes amphibians birds why simply because almost all of these groups of uh, organisms are and even plants are dependent on insects in many different ways so insects do form a huge chunk of the prey base for many species but apart from that they provide valuable ecosystem services such as pollination and so therefore their link and their uh, the dependence of plants on insects and this enormous contribution that the insects uh, make to our economy also if you really had to measure it but for uh, some reasons sort of which we uh, uh, people who are interested in insects are unable to understand <laughs> we are not appreciating um, the presence of insects around us and uh, certainly we often miss uh, the fact that these are little packages of evolutionary wonders okay and i will try to explain to you or at least uh, make a point that why i think they are so okay so uh, if you look at this huge diversity the first question that comes to our mind is why this huge diversity why are these insects so many uh, of, of so many kinds of so many forms why are they so successful why so diverse and uh, again uh, wilson uh, mentions uh, a few arguments and uh, in which basically he says that it is the answers are likely to be speculative we still don't know we can't really say for sure that this is that but one of the key traits which is likely to contribute to this enormous diversity of insects that we see is their small size this miniature you know very very tiny an, uh, animals that are around us okay so very small size and how is this small size an advantage uh, offers what kind of advantage can it offer so basically since these animals are very tiny or small they also occupy relatively small niches so ecological niche the concept is basically the ecological function that the an animal has in a particular ecosystem so it could be with respect to the kind of habitat it uses it could be with uh, respect to the kind of resources it uses uh, or the function other uh, kind of function for instance if it's a predator or is a prey so these animals since they are occupying such tiny niches it is possible that in any given ecosystem any given environment many specialists can exist each occupying these specialized niches okay so they can exist in seemingly crowded biological uh, niches okay and also of course insects came before many others so that is there so uh, and they have had the time to evolve various uh, interesting traits some of which we will talk about today for instance we uh, started farming only a few thousand years ago but insects have Uh, been farming for millions of years in fact they are known to be the first farmers okay and in this uh, uh, slide what you can see these are leaf cutter ants they are just carrying um, uh, pieces of a leaf which they have cut and they take it to their uh, what we call as uh, 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 gardens fungus gardens and where they farm these uh, special kind of fungi on which the larvae of the ants feed okay the adults do not feed on the fungi they uh, it is the larvae for whom they are growing this fungus and to grow the fungus they are collecting these leaves which they take into this climate control chambers in their uh, fungus uh, fungal gardens and so much so that they also um, uh, have a very interesting symbiotic relationship with uh, the fungi and they also protect the fungus in turn by uh, the use of certain kind of uh, antibiotics that they grow 
certain kind of bacteria that grow on the body of the ants, which confer certain protection to the fungus itself from other kinds of infection. So it's a very interesting uh, system, but which sort of tells us that they have been growing their own food and they have been doing so for millions of years. They have been uh, doing this much, much before us. Okay, Animal husbandry. So taking, you know, like a shepherd, taking care of their uh, animals from whom they are uh, deriving certain nutrition. So in this particular picture, again, you have ants and these are uh, these tiny little insects. These are also insects which are called aphids. So the aphids feed on the plant sap and the ants then uh, uh, they feed on the excess of the plant sap that the aphids secrete out. Okay, so uh, they are sort of rearing these aphids and then benefiting. So they care for the aphids by providing protection against certain other kinds of predators uh, which may eat the aphids, but they benefit by getting the plant sap in return, which the aphids excrete out. The excess is what the aphids are excreting. So animal husbandry, they have done. the first flyers, they were the ones who to have evolved powered flight, the first ones to have evolved powered flight. And these were um, insects that resembled uh, dragonflies. And this was like more than 300 million years ago. And uh, uh, like we know that, of course, there are only uh, I think four times that powered flight ha has evolved uh, in uh, the history of uh, evolution of animals, but insects were the first. And apparently it has happened in the insect, this uh, evolution of powered flight only once, okay? So here again, they, are, uh, they were the first to uh, fly. And if you look at insects around you, if you can open your eyes and ears to the insects, you will see this enormous diversity enormous forms, enormous uh, variety of colors. Um, and uh, this is basically just collection of beetles. These are various kinds of ants. These are various butterfly uh, uh, wings, just to make a point how diverse and how uh, beautiful insects can be. The only rate limiting step in our appreciation to uh, the insects that surround us is our own ability to perceive them. The night, of course, brings different sets of challenges and a different set of uh, animals that appear, including insects. So these are crickets, uh, which you can hear in the background. And any night scene is incomplete without the sound of the crickets that you can hear. Okay, so you these are nocturnal insects, crickets. So these, this is a field cricket. Uh, copulating the male and the female. In this case, uh, the male mounts the, the the female mounts the male. Okay, and these crickets are the ones who produce. So you can think of them as musicians. They were um, uh, they they can produce sound. And I'll talk a little more about uh, crickets. Uh, how they produce sound, very interesting way in which they produce sound. But these are only found in the night time. And because these are nocturnal, they are even less conspicuous to us and even less uh, visible or uh, we, we uh, really fail to notice them, okay? Uh, after the talk is over, once the night falls, I would uh, ask each one of you to just take a walk in your garden or any open space and you will be able to hear them, okay? You will be able to hear them and each one, each species will have its own unique uh, sound patterns. So this, these are the insects of the night. Of course, we also have moths as you know, which are, you can say, cousins of butterflies and, of course, fireflies, okay? So some of these insects that are found in the night are, like I said, already insects are underappreciated and the nocturnal insects are, since we humans are very uh, visually orienting, we cannot see them easily and therefore they practically do not exist in our uh, world, okay? But it is just a uh, matter of us paying attention to them and I hope that after this talk you will be able to uh, look around your environment and find these nocturnal insects and think about the kinds of behaviors that we will talk about today. For instance, the firefly, as you know, uh, for those of you who know Ogden Nash, it's a very interesting um, uh, um, limerick that he wrote for um, the firefly. The firefly's flame is something 
for which science has no name. I can think of nothing eerier than flying around with an unidentified glow on a person's posterior. Okay, so Ogden Nash, of course, in his own style, uh, jokes about this, that uh, the, we don't know what this glow is, but actually he was wrong. We know what this glow is. We, there is a name for it. Okay, it's bioluminescence. And how, uh, so this is a firefly larvae, even the larvae can, um, uh, they also glow, okay. And this is just to show that the, uh, like I was saying, the nocturnal uh, landscape is very beautiful. If you pay attention, if you pay close attention to these uh, tiny creatures. So bioluminescence of uh, these fireflies, many of you may be knowing, and for those who do not know, um, is basically a result of a chemical reaction. So these fireflies, which basically are glowing beetles, if you like, they have a specialized organ in their abdomen in which um, uh, uh, in combin when oxygen combines with ATP molecules, magnesium and luciferin in the presence of this enzyme called luciferase, it produces light. And what is interesting about this uh, chemical reaction that zero heat is produced in this. Uh, and the other interesting fact is that uh, these adult males produce these species specific light patterns, okay? So they may uh, flash a certain number of times at a certain temporal uh, pattern, okay? So separated by a certain time scale. And this temporal pattern of flashing is then perceived by the females who decodes that it is a male of its own species and it may indicate its approval by flashing once and after which the fireflies copulate. So this is this is one one of uh, a not so common example of animals that communicate by vision, okay, or visually, uh, even in night. Okay, so as we know, in the night, uh, vision is, has limited role to play, but the fireflies are a notable exception of visually communicating nocturnal animals. But the problem, of course, is that. Uh, habitat loss and um, uh, not surprisingly artificial light is apparently driving them to extinction. I don't know how many of you know about uh, this festival in Pune uh, which is called the Firefly Festival in which just pre-monsoon a lot of the hills sort of get covered with uh, fireflies and you can this is an absolute spectacle and there are various organizations that organize treks through these uh, forests and hills just so that one can, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience to just walk into this huge sea of fireflies. It's absolutely fantastic. But um, so with this coating patterns, this flashing patterns, of course, fireflies sort of recognize the same species, conspecific uh, communication. But in the presence of light, of course, you know, this, this, their uh, flashing light, this, their glow is not bright enough. And this communication sort of breaks down. Okay. So, our light bulb basically is driving them to extinction. They are not being able to communicate with each other, not being able to, you know, find mates to reproduce. And therefore, what can we do? I mean, switch off the light bulb, okay, when you don't need it, especially outdoors. I mean, we, we have now a habit of lighting up every single outdoor space, even if it is not frequented by us. So we light up the trees, we light up our uh, forests, the edges of the roads, uh, even... Uh, at times when there's absolutely little or no need for that light to be there. So this is something for us to think about. What else? Uh, other kind of uh, nocturnal insects, of course, are moths, like I said. These are some moth uh, images which I have taken from a book that we are working on. These are moths of Mohali. And uh, this is to tell you just uh, in Mohali itself, we found 135 species of uh, moths of which over 70 are reported from Punjab for the first time. There is no other, uh, we could not find any other reports uh, which suggest that these are found in Punjab. So this is basically to tell you, and this is uh, to, to sort of tell you the, how less we know about these uh, uh, animals that are in our backyards, basically. This is Aisar Mohali campus, this is not a forest but uh, we found so many different species of moths and we curated this information in which we are now trying to take it out as a, a field guide to moths of uh, Aisar Mohali. And as you can see, various different kinds of moth species, which basically uh, are waiting uh, to be worked on. And there's very little uh, 
uh, e ecology, there's a lot of taxonomic work that has happened uh, and uh, only uh, in, 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 in India, but moths offer a fantastic model system to study behavior, especially in relation to predation. And as you may know, bats are of two kinds. They are fruit bats, and then there are the insectivorous bats. And for insectivorous bat moths and crickets and katydids are an important uh, uh, source of uh, food. And so with respect to predation, just studying moths is uh, absolutely fantastic. They've offered to be a great model system, and I'll tell you why. One, for instance, there are several moth species that have uh, different kinds of tricks to uh, evade their predators. In this case, I'm just showing a moth, uh, uh, which if you look at it, the four wings are very drab and uh, dull looking. But when a, uh, when, uh, the, a predator approaches or there's a tactile stimulation, then what the moth does is basically opens up and flashes this really bright uh, colors and uh, uh, which will uh, allow it a few seconds, which will startle the predator and al allow it a few seconds to escape. This is one strategy to evade predators. The other kind of uh, strategies that moths have, I wanted to talk about and which is very interesting to me and I hope to you as well, is to evade the predators. The moths have what we call as escape flights. Now, this escape flight basically is simply an erratic movement uh, pattern. So uh, it could be like a sudden movement from, so it's in, uh, sitting on a twig and there's a, a bat that approaches, okay, the moth and the moth will suddenly uh, go into flight and an erratic flight, which could be in loops or sharp turns and zigzag patterns. So now this unpredictability of movement will allow it to escape the predator and the question really being is that can they really outsmart the bats because after all bats also need to eat, right? So um, people actually studied these uh, moths and they asked whether uh, how effective this escape flight polymorphism and what is that? Basically e different individuals or different species uh, in this case may have different kinds of escape flights. One species may have loops, one species may have zigzags, some other species may have. So first of all, are these patterns species specific? Do certain species of moths have certain kinds of uh, escape flight uh, patterns? And uh, if it is species specific, um, do uh, different kinds of moths or species that have different kinds of escape flight, do they sort of come together and coexist and which will that allow greater um, uh, evasion from predator okay so these are the kinds of questions people ask and this is just to tell you one example of some one study that was done um, in max planck uh, institute of ornithology by teresa and holger and uh, what they looked at was to measure this flight escape flight polymorphism in which they tethered a moth uh, and they used, uh, they tethered it to the membrane of the speakers and then the movement of the membrane of the speaker is then translated into uh, electric signals to measure the flight pattern, okay? And to see whether different species have different patterns and what do they find? Basically, they find that yes, these different species have different kinds of uh, uh, evasive maneuvers and uh, uh, the flying uh, moth that was tethered to the membrane of the speakers, they uh, when you uh, excite them by playing back the calls of uh, bats, um, what they do is it induces the, so these are eared moths so they can hear and the, it induces them to fly and this erratic pattern of flight you can pick up by the movement of the uh, speakers. And they found that these are, there are species specific differences in the escape flight, not only species specific, in fact, within the species also in some cases, individual level differences were found. And now, so what does that result in? Basically what it results in, if you have a common predator and this common predator is now uh, having to deal with or understand the patterns and learn the uh, associative learning, learn the patterns of so many different kinds of um, uh, species, okay? So one may go in loops, one may go in zigzag. So this increases the overall unpredictability of these flight patterns. And this is likely to confer 
higher protection against a common predator. So you have 10 different species that coexist together. And these 10 different species, each one having their own uh, flight erratic flight patterns, will uh, allow them to increase unpredictability and um, uh, probably diminish learning of uh, these escape flights by these common predators. What else do these moths do? So startle response was one escape uh, strategy, erratic flight and unpredictable uh, unpredictability, another strategy and how these community of moths form. So looking at species specific uh, uh, interactions. The third way and very interesting way in which uh, moths uh, avoid bats is by this um, acoustic interactions. And like you know, uh, insectivorous bats produce sound. Uh, so they produce ultrasound and uh, then they use the sound, the, the sub beam of sound that they produce then hits the object and then they perceive back the echo. And it's just the same thing like how we see our world, but uh, we see, we do this in light and they look at the reflection of sound. They hear the reflection of sound and navigate and also to find food. So these uh, bats that are echolocating can now detect the movement of these prey. But we know that the, again, this is Holger's work um, along with uh, various other colleagues from University of Bristol, uh, where uh, we now know that they can not just detect the movement of live prey, but also the shape, size, and even texture of these um, insects. Okay, so that is the kind of marvel, you know, of echolocation that these bats can do. But well, our moths are not um, too far behind. So there is a group of moths which are basically eared moths. They actually have a tympanum with, by which they can hear these echolocation calls, and they can basically just to sort of uh, simplify the idea is to they they are able to hear their predators approach because the bat has to produce the echolocation calls to be able to navigate and to be able to find its food and if the moths can hear these echolocation calls so if you if you tune into those frequencies then you can hear the predator approach and when it hears the predator approach, it can have another bunch of uh, uh, strategies to avoid the predator, which is to escape, erratic flight, or um, uh, even jam the signals of the bats. So basically they produce sound, moths can produce sound, and the sound basically matches the frequency range in which the bats are producing the echolocation calls, and they basically jam those signals, okay? So then you know, the bats get confused and the moth gets this fraction of uh, time to sort of escape. So as you can imagine that there is this enormous, very exciting uh, behavior uh, and uh, strategies and counter strategies, adaptations and counter adaptations going on with uh, between um, various organisms that are around us. I mean, all of these, you don't have to go to Germany to study these moths and bats, they're all around us. You, if you go out and uh, watch, like I said, uh, it's a good time to have this talk because after this talk, Please walk out of your homes and you will see the bats moving around. You will see them near the floodlights uh, or very bright uh, street lights. You will find moths uh, swarming and you will see how the bats are catching these moths. Okay, So this, and this night landscape basically is unraveling this huge, this uh, enormous uh, evolutionary drama, if you like, in these night skies, which is this evolutionary arms race. So now the bats have echolocation to find the moths. The moths can hear the echolocating bats and jam the moth signals. What do the bats do? Well, we know the story goes on. Moths, there are a group of bats who can basically reduce the uh, loudness of their echolocation so that the moths cannot hear the bats approach. So these are whisper, what we call as whispering bats. So they reduce the volume, if you like, or rather the sound pressure level of their echolocation calls. Um, allowing the bats to sneak up on these moths, okay? So this is, you know, this adaptation, counter-adaptation, so evolutionary arms race, okay? There's so much, so many interesting things about these nocturnal insects uh, and that they provide such interesting model systems to study animal behavior, to study ecology. And also uh, for those of you who are interested um, uh, in uh, biomimetics, you would know that insects provide an excellent, uh, an excellent model system for biomimetics as well. Um, the third group of nocturnal insects that I wanted to talk about are the orthopteran insects. They were the uh, basically orthoptera 
uh, includes uh, grasshoppers and crickets and katydids and these were literally again again another first for first for the insects they were the first musicians uh, of uh, earth and they, uh, these uh, in in this slide what i have is these are crickets and katydids of kudremukh national park which is where i worked for several years and uh, we know that there there is a uh, uh, enormous diversity of uh, these uh, crickets that are calling the producing sound communicating acoustically uh, inside the rainforest okay and that itself now that is a perfect setting to ask all kinds of evolutionary and ecological questions and i'll tell you a few but before that let me play uh, a few song calls for you just so that you get a feel for what they these insects sound like and what you might hear outside will be very different so don't look for these crickets but these are the kudremo crickets so this one is phaloria interesting guy very loud but only calls near streams so it is always found near uh, uh, wet habitat very loud yeah and as you can see uh there are this the wings seem almost like crumpled and i'll talk about that in a moment this is what the sound looks like so this is an oscillogram where you have time on the x axis and you have energy on the y axis this is a power spectrum where you have frequency on the x axis and energy on the y axis okay these are just representations of sound this is mycopoda we call it two part is myco one of the five different type call types of mycopoda we found in kudremukh and again listen to the call is so different and so interesting yeah so dull looking animal but very interesting to hear yeah again here if you notice just look at the frequency range it goes almost up to 80 kilohertz it's a very broad band species okay so range is from 20 to 70 kilohertz the previous one is a narrow, narrow band species you can see most of the energy is sort of concentrated in a narrow range of frequency around 4 kilohertz yeah so narrow band species and trilling species a chirping species which is very broad band or goes into ultrasound here yeah? and another katydid in this case onomarcus this is a very interesting katydid a story i shall not be telling today maybe some other day um, to some of you so this katydid katydids are known to be uh, very broad band in their signals so they produce very noisy scratchy calls but this cricket uh, this katydid that we found which is exclusively found on jackfruit trees here yeah? it produces a very narrow band call and a relatively low very low frequency call which is very uncharacteristic of katydid so listen to the call so much so that for a very long time we kept mistaking the this katydid for a frog anyways so this is just to give you a feel for how these um, uh, orthopteran insects sound like now just highlight two problems huh, for these insects so the small size wild has served them well with respect to escaping from uh, predators and to accommodate uh, in very crowded biological niches the miniaturization of this body plan has uh, also poses various kind of challenges and limitations for these insects uh, which are associated with how do they perceive sound so if you think about a cricket the ears of the crickets are on the knee joints or on the legs so between the two legs a cricket itself the entire size of the cricket is around 5 kilohertz okay uh, sorry 5 uh, centimeters yeah it's a very small animal and the distance between the four legs this is where the four legs is where the ears are here is where the ears are so this distance is not very large okay and if you think of the uh, uh, frequency of sound or about 5 kilohertz 4 to 5 kilohertz if you calculate the wave length at given uh, when uh, you produce a particular sound directionality of the sound comes because of uh, either sound arriving in one side of the ear uh, faster uh, and a slight delay which is interoral time difference uh, so if there's a delay in the arrival of sound that can cause result in directionality or if there's a difference in the sound pressure on the on the two ears okay both of this cannot happen in the crickets because of their small uh, uh, size and as a result of the small size this very tiny 
uh, space between the two years and there is no nothing in between these years remember we have a head between the two years the crickets don't have it so this poses a certain problem as to how they will perceive sound direction and i will not go into the story today but i would uh, urge you to read up if you are interested in how the insect has solved this problem of directionality in fact it has solved this problem of directionality not just of hearing how the sound uh, how the, uh, where the sound is coming from but exact precise location from where the sound is coming so they have solved this problem uh, also with respect to production you know this is a very small uh, sized animal and how do they produce sound so i'll tell you a little bit about how they produce sound but uh, before that i will also tell you that is not just the size which is a problem it is also the numbers large numbers of individuals calling very close to each other is a problem okay and if i am speaking and at the same time if there is some noise going on in the background some others are speaking around you you are going to find it very hard to pay attention to uh, what i am saying okay because what happens is our sound again jamming so the sound sort of get uh, masked okay from multiple sound sources so this is known as the cocktail party problem which is basically a problem of sound source uh, segregation in a multi source uh, environment where there are multiple sources of sound and they are all arriving uh, together and they end up you know sort of overlapping uh, with each other in uh, frequency and in uh, uh, time so this complex cocktail of sound is what is what the receiver actually gets so you are in a rainforest you are a male you are a cricket and you are producing sound but there are so many other crickets that are also producing sound and whoever is listening to you which basically the female crickets are listening they are going to receive this cocktail of sound and how do they actually segregate these streams of sound which is of interest to them that is a cocktail party problem and that is a problem not of size but of numbers okay which will happen in conferences and uh, crowded uh, spaces and you can think of many other examples of acoustic masking interference or jamming so before i go into the details of masking and this is what i would want to talk about with respect to crickets i want to uh, explain to you how masking basically uh, works so since there are multiple signalers the signals will overlap with each other because of time of arrival they are arriving at the same time but these signals can be of the same type or can be of different types for instance if you are in a bus stand and you are having a conversation with a friend and if a bus you know uh, this passes by your part of your conversation is going to be drowned in that noise okay so something similar can happen with the crickets where a very different kind of sound is drowning you out okay so that is mask and this could happen when different kinds of species a uh, different species is drowning you out so that will be called as heterospecific masking uh, on the other hand if your own kind so there are multiple individuals who are signaling and your noisy neighbor is drowning your sound and your noisy neighbor is of your own kind or your own species then we say it is conspecific masking okay so now i just uh, explain to you how this um, what is the problem of this heterospecific masking and conspecific masking and how are they different so imagine various birds that are in um, uh, what we call as mixed species flock and they are all singing together uh, there is one the sound of one species there is another kind of sound see these sounds are different i'm just this is just a schematic to make a point that this is the sound of say species 1 the green thing the blue thing is of species 2 and there's a species 3 okay so these three are arriving at the same time and then you get this cocktail of sound okay something like this is happening in the rainforest of kudramukh where there are multiple species 20 different species of crickets and multiple individuals of these various species which are masking each other drowning each other out okay on the other hand conspecific masking the sound that drowns you out is exactly your kind okay so from say for instance individual 1 from individual 2 same kind of sound same kind of sound so temporal pattern and the spectral pattern the frequency at which they are producing this sound is exactly the same which was not the case in case of heterospecific masking okay and this happens in many cases in animal kingdom not just when humans talk to each other in a crowded uh, uh, cocktail party scenario 
This happens when bats are emerging from a roost, when frogs and toads are communicating together in a pond or uh, you know a colony of seabirds. Um, uh, so all, and they were trying to communicate. So they're all the same type and they're all producing sound. And this is a cocktail of sound, which is likely to be worse. Conspecific masking is likely to be worse because the sound is exactly the same. In case of heterospecific masking, the sound types are different. So there is scope for extracting information from those differences in the uh, nature of the sound. Okay. So having said that, now let's go to Acoustic, let's go to crickets and uh, the cocktail party problem in crickets. Basically, these crickets, males produce sound. How do they produce sound and why are these crickets very interesting from the sound production perspective? They have ears on their knees, but they produce their sound now like us with the vocal cord or like the birds with the syrinx. They produce sound by rubbing their wings together. And on the wings, there are certain structures called which are basically sound producing structures and this allows them to produce sound. Only males have this specialized structure in this case the file and the plectrum and the harp, the mirror and the female wing, this is the wing of the female, does not bear these structures. This triangular structure, this round structure, this is all missing in the females. So the females basically, the crickets, female crickets are silent, okay. They are silent but they are the ones who exercise choice. They will decide whether the sound of the male is good enough, whether she will mate with the male, depending upon the sound of the male. So it is in the interest of the male to ensure that his its call is transmitted safely in as a neat package to the cricket uh, to the female cricket, and it's not ruined by the masking of other by other males. Okay. So just to uh, show you how they produce sound, they produce sound by raising their wings together and then they rub their wings. As they rub their wings, their teeth-like structure on the underside of the wings, okay? And there is a hardened structure on the other side of the wing, which basically rubs against this teeth. This is stridulation or something very similar to how uh, the plectrum goes to the strings on the guitar and very similar way sound is produced. Every strike results in one pulse of sound, okay? So again, this is an oscillogram. This is the power spectrum. So this particular cricket has a particular free peak frequency around 5 kilohertz. Now this unique package of sound must now be delivered by the males and the female must now in complete darkness approach this male to be able to mate. So where is the problem? The problem is because of masking. If you are being masked by another species, then it is heterospecific masking. The problem is the same, okay, but slightly different. Conspecific masking when you are masked by your own kind. So this common problem, but the solutions are different and I'll tell you how. In case of heterospecific masking, what we know, what the crickets do is basically, since the different species have different kinds of frequencies, the females or the receivers, let's say the receiver, whoever is perceiving the sound, if the receiver is tuned to that particular frequency, just like the radio, you are tuning into certain frequency band, then you hear only that channel. So that is one very powerful way of reducing noise. So you, it might be a cacophony around you, but if you can tune into a narrow range of frequencies, then you can avoid masking or then the package will be safely delivered to you simply because the female is tuned. Okay, so receiver tuning is a powerful way of avoiding masking and males calling at different frequencies for so different species having these different frequencies allows this kind of uh, sender receiver match and thereby reduction in masking. The other way in which heterospecific masking can be avoided is by having differences in the loudness of the call. So one species uh, is very loud, the other species is soft, the louder one is going to be, even if the it is very similar to the other species with respect to the sphere frequency patterns of the spectral partitioning does not, not happen, then it can just simply have a louder call and escape masking. So calling louder or having a loud species specific call um, or sound and having specific frequencies are two independent ways in which heterospecific masking can be avoided. Other ways in which heterospecific masking can be avoided, 
and this is not in the case of the Kudramukh crickets. In Kudramukh cricket, these were the only two ways which we saw that they were avoiding masking. But you can call it different times of the day or the night rather. Or you can call it different time, be active at different times of the year. So this is temporal partitioning. Or you can have your calls inserted in the silent intervals of the other uh, maskers call. So that is fine temporal partitioning. Or you can move away from your masker. So spatial partitioning. All of these are various strategies in which animals can avoid heterospecific masking. Conspecific masking, on the other hand, since they are all the same species, they can't be active at different times of the year or the night. They have to be active together. So all of these options are ruled out. The only option is fine temporal partitioning, which is where they are inserting their calls in the silent intervals of their masker. Spectral partitioning is ruled out because it has to be the same frequency since these are conspecific. And spatial partitioning is also ruled out because we know same species usually occur at the same um, uh, height. Okay, The only way they can avoid uh, uh, conspecific masking by spatial partitioning is by moving away from a noise source. And of course, loudness by actively changing their loudness, becoming louder when there is a masker. So we ask these questions, do they do any of these things? And is there potential for conspecific masking in field crickets? We studied this in Isab Mohali campus. And this was done on this uh, really dull looking, but very interesting species, Acanthoglis asiaticus. This is what the calls are, it looks like. Very broadly distributed all over India, but this was the first study on this species. So this goes on to tell you such a broadly distributed species, nobody has ever worked on. So we first of all asked, where are these animals calling from? So are they close enough to each other that their calls are going to be heard by each other? So we flagged the positions of all callers and we measured the nearest neighbor distances. So we found that on an average, the nearest neighbor is three meters, three and a half meters away. So we asked, does the sound actually travel three and a half meters? If the sound does not travel three and a half meters, then you are okay. Then you don't really mask uh, too much. But the song, uh, the sound does seem to travel up to three meters. Okay, so which means from the position of the male, if you draw a radius of three meters, their animals are going to be, their circles or this uh, space or acoustic space is going to overlap. And these are natural choruses, some examples to see how dense these choruses can be or how um, uh, empty these choruses can be. So here in this case, ma male 11 does not face any masking, but in some other chorus, there might be a lot of masking. So looking at um, modeling their spatial position and their sound transmission in natural habitat, we figured out on an average, at least uh, there are, on an average, there are two maskers to every individual and one masker can actually hear you, which basically means it, if it can hear you, then it can reset or do something about it. Okay, so there is masking and on an average by two and at least one audible masker. So we ask how do they deal with this masking? So like I said, signals can arrive exactly on time. So this is a call of same male one. This is a call of male two. They can arrive exactly at the same time, which is synchrony or they can arrive such that they are out of phase of each other. So here, male one and male two are out of phase. So this, uh, this pulse of sound or this chirp of the cricket, the second male is in the silent interval of this male. So which basically means it will escape masking. So we asked, and you can basically calculate what is the phase angle between uh, uh, any given two males. And if it is around 180 degrees, so, so from 180 degrees to 270 degrees in case of our crickets, that would, if, if the phase angle is between this, that means it is escaping masking. So you basically have measurement, you make measurements of males that are calling next to each other and you ask, measure the phase angle of calling between these two males and you ask, is it, are they alternating? or are they in synchrony and what is the probability of overlap? So we looked at field observations. We found two males that are calling in close proximity. We measured their calls and we measured the phase angle. And as you can see, the mean vector is around 180 degree, bang. Okay, so there is perfect alternation. So you can see that in the field, these males, while they are fairly close to each other, they alternate with their nearest neighbor. So if you alternate with your nearest neighbor, then there is no masking because the next nearest neighbor is likely to be further away and it is less likely to uh, mask your call, okay? So you have solved a problem in a very, very cheap way.
Okay, so alternation is what we find. Of course, we did control experiments in the lab to check whether uh, if you simulate a male by a speaker, then will the male actually start alternating? And yes, like we predicted, it does alternate. Of course, not as perfectly, but still will within 270 degrees. So if it falls here, by and large, the mean vector is around 218 degrees. So it is alternating. Last but not so fine temporal partitioning, definitely they are doing some fine temporal partitioning. But how are they doing that? They are doing that by actively changing their rate of calling. So in solo, if you measure their chirp, uh, well, let's just call it the rate at which the chirps are being produced is lower than when they produce these chirps when there's a masker around them. And this shift in the rate of calling F results effectively in alternation okay so we found this is how they are solving the masking problem last but not the least we asked that can they actually increase their volume so if there is too much noise can you go louder okay and we uh, uh, did various experiments you have the uh, sound level of a focal male measured and then you expose it to either a softer male or a louder male okay and then you reverse the order of presentation, louder or softer, and you sort of randomize the order of uh, presentation across various trials. And you ask that, do the males, when they produce uh, calls in uh, solo, whatever their uh, loudness is, in response to a, a neighbor, do they increase the volume or uh, the sound pressure level of their call? So we checked it when they are exposed to a soft color first and then a loud color. We also did the reverse just to control for order of presentation, uh, response to a loud color and soft color, no matter what, basically they do not increase, go beyond their natural loudness. So they are unable to or incapable of increasing, actively changing their sound pressure level. So they are not solving the masking problem by becoming louder, but they're solving the masking problem by alternating, okay? Just to summarize, conspecific masking avoidance in the crickets, one, they space out. They space out in a manner that the natural choruses have on an average one audible masker, okay? At most two on an average, okay? So that already takes care of some, uh, some amount of uh, masking problem. So there is some sort of spatial organization that allows reduction in masking. Then there is fine temporal partitioning where they're inserting their calls in the silent interval by adjusting the rate of calling, but they do not seem to be able to increase the loudness of the call. This is how these crickets, these invertebrates, these tiny animals, dull looking, very modest looking and not so uh, interesting maybe to most people, they are solving certain problems, acoustic problems, and solving this problem such that they can communicate efficiently with the receivers. So the solutions are very different from the solutions employed to tackle heterospecific masking. Okay, so common problem, but different solutions. To summarize and to uh, basically conclude my presentation, I would like to remind you that each of these insects, the three groups of insects, I, the nocturnal insects I talked about, uh, the fireflies, the moths, and the crickets. There are so many interesting things to talk about them. I just chose one or two of their behaviors to talk about today. Uh, these insects, not just the nocturnal, but all insects are fast disappearing. And the problem is that we just don't know by how much because insects are just so many in numbers that to begin with, since there are so many in numbers, it is dis difficult to assess, hard to assess the reduction in number, but we know now there is data which is pouring in from all over the world that we are in a phase where there is what we call as an insect apocalypse. Insects are disappearing and it is very, very worrying. Um, this has also been uh, called as a windshield uh, phenomenon, basically uh, how uh, uh, long back, I don't know, uh, for the younger audience, perhaps you would not know, but uh, during our times, you know, if you are just driving past uh, uh, some habitat, does not even have to be a foresty habitat, there are going to be several insects that come and, you know, bang against your windshield, right? That is not happening anymore. That is when people notice that when they are moving through forests, there are not enough insects that are coming and, you know, cr crashing against your windshield. That is when people started to get Worry, worried about it and they started measuring it 
okay, more systematically. And we now know that there's massive global decline in insects. So large is their numbers that it is, to begin with, that it is difficult to assess the reduction since they are so small, inconspicuous, especially the nocturnal ones, so hard to track. It is going to be an enormously difficult, challenging task to figure out this reduction and maybe by the time we figure this out or do something about it maybe it will be too late for us so baseline data is completely missing okay historical records of numbers of individuals and numbers of uh, species i mean very basic stuff is uh, lacking uh, from um, i mean world over not just in india but world over so the historical records are poor so you do have nothing to compare with and the worst part is now we are not Having trained uh, taxonomists, we are not giving them jobs. We don't have jobs for people who study insects. There are no, uh, not many, not enough jobs for entomologists. Okay, so they are all out of jobs, and so there are very few experts who can actually tell you well there is a problem. So wake up. Going back to what E.O. Wilson had to say, the one process now going on that will take millions of years to correct is the loss of genetic and species diversity by the destruction of natural habitats and of course by various other ways like i said light pollution or even noise and this is the folly our descendants are least likely to forgive us for yeah so uh, i would like you all to uh, i really tried to think of how to end the talk in a very positive note uh, but it is a fact insects are disappearing and we need to do something about it uh, one thing what you can do about uh, insects is to start noticing them. So open your eyes and ears to the insects and maybe some appreciation for the insects. Uh, citizen science itself goes a long way in uh, generating uh, interest uh, um, about certain or organisms. So do whatever you can. If you can, you study them, okay? Uh, from the perspective of an engineer, from the perspective of a biologist, from the perspective of a biophysicist, to look at how the eardrums, uh, you know, are filtering out certain sounds, to look at uh, from the perspective of uh, chemical ecology of what kinds of uh, plants these insects are consuming. And uh, so there are so many different ways in which we can study insects. Uh, we at ISAM Mohali, we are studying insects. We do study moths and crickets. This is my group at ISAM Mohali. These are my students. We also study birds. And uh, like I said, that is a story uh, to tell uh, on another day. We study babblers, looking at the social behavior and acoustic communication. And this is Aisar Mohali. Uh, if you are interested in uh, understanding what more, what kind of work we do, you can go to the website and uh, or visit the Twitter handle. And thank you very much for uh, joining in. And I'll be very happy to interact with you if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Um, Yeah, can I stop the line? Uh, you have done, you have answered the questions, right? Yes, if there are questions, I would like to answer them. So um, please let me know how to address these questions. And uh, uh, I'm also okay with the uh, questions being emailed to me, if uh, that is what you want to do. Okay, thank you. So you got one question, ma'am. Question I mentioned in the chat. I hope you, you, if you answered, then we can leave it. Um, okay. Crickets produce sound, but why can't we detect the direction of such sound origin? Is it because of multiple reflections or particular feature of the sound? Okay, so the answer to the question is um, that there are some crickets that produce sound in the ultrasound. So Uday, thank you for your question. Um, so if they are ultrasonic, then of course, for instance, Mycopoda, a large fraction of its sound is in the ultrasound. And um, then you're not going to be able to hear them. But there are many crickets that produce sound in the acoustic uh, hearing range of humans. And why can you not hear 
simply because we don't pay attention yeah so try and pay attention try to pay attention this time when you go out and please write to me if you hear a cricket okay you they will sound something like you can think of any night scene in any movie yeah and it has this background trrr, trrr sound right that is what the crickets are like um thank you i'm glad you liked uh, the lecture uh, firuk i'll be happy to receive your questions by email as well in case um, it is uh, difficult for you to put in all the questions right now uh, yes ma'am uh, we have done with the questions uh, we can okay so thank, thank you very much for having me here